Welcome to Lesson 21. It's from Romans chapter 12, verse 9, through chapter 13, verse 7. This is Paul talking to us today about our conduct as a Christian, the way we behave in the world. Billy Graham said our lives were the loudest sermons that we would ever preach. And I completely agree. Your best witness isn't based on the amount of knowledge or the amount of experience you might have had. It's quite simply the way you live your life. And so Paul has transitioned in the book of Romans from teaching Christians about their salvation to teaching them how to live like a person who's been saved. He urged Christians to offer themselves, their lives, as their witness, their sacrifice to God, because that is how we worship Him. To do that, we can't be conformed to this world, but instead we need to be transformed by the Holy Spirit within, who transforms our thoughts and our minds. And we're renewed in a way that we can live a life that pleases God. And so, we know then what it means to do the will of God because we know the will of God. And then he concluded, we concluded last week's lesson by saying, now that you know what you're supposed to do, Paul said, and now that you know you've been uniquely gifted to serve God, do that, just do that. And he picks up from there today. He said we were supposed to humbly view ourselves with sober judgment according to our faith. He said that all people were uniquely gifted. Paul taught the key was to serve God with and through the spiritual gifts that we have been given through God's grace. And then finally, he said, don't just know what you're supposed to do. Do those things. The next Subheading in the NIV translation of the Bible describes the next section of scripture as love in action. If someone were to ask you, what should the Christian life look like? Today's passage would be a great answer to that question. Uh, we're gonna study, or as we study, imagine our culture. If all Christians adhered to, believed, and and let their lives be transformed into the people that Paul is going to talk about today, the character that Paul is going to describe today. I think today's passage is probably in Scripture my favorite understanding of what our daily Christian life should look like. And remember, when I teach this, there's none of us that will ever do it perfectly. But if we don't have the right goal, we'll never even go the right direction. It's important to set our minds on things that are above and not on things of this world. That's what Paul's gonna teach today in this passage, and it's a beautiful section of scripture. Most important to note, this will never be the standard the world sets for our lives. It's the standard for the Christian life. And Paul's always had higher standard, standards for his kids. Uh, so as God, honestly, think about it as a parent. If you're a parent, don't you kind of have higher standards for your children than you do for everyone else's? And so uh, it's just the way of life. God has very high expectations of who we can be if we just yield our life to His Holy Spirit's leading. And I look around at the news sometimes and see what appears to be the direction of things in our American culture. And I often think about the verse from 2 Chronicles 7 where God said, you tell them if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear their prayers, forgive their sins, and heal their land. But I've always taught the three most important words 
in that whole passage are the first three. God's standard for us is different. He said, if my people. I wonder if the direction of the culture isn't, isn't most related to the direction the church has taken in the last 50 years. We've kind of entered our own buildings and we've kind of invited people to come see us. One of my favorite quotes on this subject is from a man named Francis Fenelon, who was a pastor in the early 20th century. And he defined the church in a way I found fascinating. He said, the church is the only institution in the world that exists purely for the sake of those outside its walls. And the reason I think that matters is because that is the purpose of the church. But have we lost that sense in our culture today? Uh, that, I believe, is what Paul is trying to speak to today. Our standards are different. We exist for the sake of others. And I think the problems in our culture today are largely because the church has stepped back from the culture today and not invaded it as an army like we were supposed to. We're to be in the world, but not of it. We think of the not of it nowadays more than we think of the fact we're supposed to be in the world. So imagine what Paul is about to teach as what should be our Christian reputation in our culture. This is what the Lord would want for our lives. This is the witness, the sermon our life is supposed to preach. Paul begins in chapter 12, verse 9, saying, Love must be sincere. I just pause there. For my entire lifetime, the greatest uh, slander, I think, or the most common slander in, of the culture against Christianity is that we're hypocrites. And they're right, we are. Who's not an actor at times? In the Bible, the word hypocrite literally meant putting on a mask and pretending to be someone you weren't. It was a, a word taken from the stage, the acting stage that was so popular in the Greek culture. Paul says our love must be sincere. He says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. If that was who we were, if that that Paul has just written described what people thought Christians were in our world today, wouldn't that be an amazing witness to our culture? We're the ones who sincerely care. We're the ones who love with the love of Christ, which is so much greater than our own. It's okay to hate what is evil. It's good to hate what is evil. But it, in order to do that, we also have to cling to what is good. We need to trust that what the Bible says is good. Some of what we've lost in our world today is this notion that somehow the way we feel is more important than what God has said is true. Our feelings will change. God's word never does. Hate what is evil, but cling to what you know is good. God's word is good. Be devoted to one another in love. And remember, Paul is writing to Christians. What if the church was the place where when people entered, they would know there was always someone there that was going to truly care about their life, truly care about them, 
that was devoted to being their friend. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. We don't fit ministry into our time frame or into what we feel like we have the capacity for. If someone needs our help, they actually are the person that is supposed to come first, not ourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. There is nothing I hate more than to walk down the hall of a church and look into a class of people that I see with glazed over eyes and a teacher that is droning out a passage from the Bible. It just causes me to cringe. We should never be apathetic about our faith. I know we all get there and I know it's my job to be excited about God's word, but it's not just that. I really do care about teaching the word of God. I really know it is the thing God made me to do and the thing that I believe will help people the most. I wanna teach with spiritual fervor, not because it's an act, but because I really believe that what I do makes a difference. You should feel that way about whatever it is you do in your life. Again, what's your giftedness? What has God created you uniquely to accomplish? Do that thing with great fervor, knowing that you're working for the Lord, not man. That's a verse from Colossians. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. All of us should be joyful because we are never without hope. No matter what happens in this world, it's only for this world. We know that heaven is our eternal existence and what happens here is not gonna harm us there. Be patient in affliction. I think that is one of the things I most need to pray for personally in my own life. I don't think I'm uh, by nature a patient person. And so I work at being patient in God's strength. When things are wrong, I want to fix them. I want to speak to it. Sometimes it's better to absorb some of the affliction than it is to react against it. How do you do that? You're faithful in prayer. Pray about it and God will give you what you need to be patient, to be hopeful, to be joyful, and then share with God's people who are in need. This doesn't mean to share with everyone, and I'll probably step on some toes with this one. It's a personal conviction of mine, but for everyone, you need to pray. Um, sometimes I wish that Christian people worked as hard to help one another as they did to help some of the organizations in this world. Uh, make sure your life is devoted to advancing God's kingdom work. And yes, that can be done through uh, secular institutions. It absolutely can. But don't ever serve secular goals in the doing of that. Always be sure that your service has a kingdom purpose. Help the Lord's people who are in need practice hospitality. Take care of each other. Be a welcoming place for other Christians to enjoy. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So hard to do in our world today, but what a witness. I remember in our own city of Dallas, um, a police officer accidentally killed a man when she walked into an apartment and thought it was her own. And she's in jail for that today. But I'll never forget the power of the victim's brother as he spoke from the stand and forgave her for what had happened, offered forgiveness, God's forgiveness. 
It's a powerful moment, and I think it spoke to everyone. The only way to bless people that persecute you and not to want to curse them is to do that through God's leadership, God's heart, God's compassion. Sometimes we try to act out of human compassion and it's not doable. And that's when we are being hypocritical and say things that we don't really mean. However, when we bless people that wouldn't necessarily deserve our blessing and refuse not to have revenge, that's one of the best ways people see God in us. And that's why Paul says, do that, live that way. It's good for Christian conduct. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Have compassion, not, and compassion means to feel with, to feel those feelings of passion with. That's what the word literally means. Feel with them. Understand with them. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. That last phrase almost sounds conceited. When we talk about people of low position, hear that from a first century mindset. To live in harmony is to work together, everyone working together. Um, to be willing to serve in whatever category you're called to serve, whether you think it's worthy of your position or not. Do whatever needs to be done, regardless of who you think or what you think you're supposed to do. Don't be conceited. Don't be full of yourself. Our job, our calling, is whatever God tells us to do whenever He tells us to do it. That's what it means to be Spirit-led. And God will bless that kind of commitment to Him. That is what He means when He says, offer your bodies as a living, daily sacrifice to whatever God wants to do. So, as we've gone through all of this, what in your own heart and mind has given you a sense of conviction? You can't ever really look at a passage like this one and not recognize the points of it where you are weaker or lacking God's uh, word in your behavior. It's not to give you guilt. It's to give you correction. It's so that you can adjust your life to what you know God wants and therefore live a life He's more able to bless. It's a good thing to feel conviction. It's a great thing when you act on it. He said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Paul is quoting Deuteronomy in this passage. It goes back to Moses' direction, the law of Moses. This is what God has always wanted. But notice in there, as far as it depends on you, uh, leave room for God's wrath. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Paul wrote this before Nero became emperor of Rome. And so his words here come with an asterisk, not because they're not truth, but because there did come a time when the church was kicked out of the city of Rome. This is when Priscilla and Aquila were probably kicked out of their home, Rome. But God redeemed that, remember, because it was Priscilla and Aquila who 
came to know Paul, making tents, and eventually went back to Rome and are probably key to establishing the church there. So why don't we repay evil for evil? Why do we turn the other cheek like Jesus taught? Why do we do our very best to do what is right in the eyes of everyone? As far as it depends on us, we're not accountable for what other people choose to do. We are accountable for how we choose to respond. Paul has just said, this is how you arrive in heaven with less to be regretful of. The reason we treat people this way is not because it's what they deserve or what is fair even. It's because it's what's best for us. It's because we don't heap up sins of our own. I used to teach my boys when I was raising them, never let other people's weaknesses cause you to sin. You're not accountable for their weaknesses. You are accountable to God and to me for yours. That's what I taught my boys. That's what Paul is trying to teach his kids in the church in Rome. Don't let other people cause you to build up sin in your own life. Leave it up to God to bring about what is fair. Leave it up to God to judge. Trust God's wrath will be perfect, but you can also know that God wants nothing more than to redeem that person to be his child as well. It's hard sometimes to want what God wants, but it's so important that we do. He says, on the contrary, this is how we're to treat our enemies. If our enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let me bring that to modern day. When someone is trying to cut you off on the freeway, slow down, let them pass. When someone cuts in line, ask if you can help carry their load. Try to know them. Respond to the wrong things in this world as best you can with the highest standards of God. In that way, and this is an interesting phrase, we heap burning coals on their head. Think about it. Think about how you felt when you made a mistake and someone reacted in a way that was grace personified. How did you feel right after, even if you didn't show it? When Paul said, you heap burning coals on his head, it was an ancient Egyptian punishment. When someone was found guilty in Egypt, they were handed a tray of burning coals and they were told to walk around asking for forgiveness from the people they had wronged with that tray of burning coals on top of their head. This was a picture of what Paul was saying. So what's Paul's solution for all the troubles in our culture today? It's to live so much higher that the world can't help but notice. And even if it's grudging, give us their respect. That's the way the church will impact the culture. Last week I quoted from John Wesley. There's a, a story known to be true that happened during the Great Awakening. It was actually a time when things had come to a low place in our own American culture. 
a time after the Roaring Twenties, um, and the culture was not good, and the church was not having an impact. And then there was the Great Awakening, a return back to the literal teaching of God's Word. And there were great tent revivals, and John Wesley was among the great preachers. One time, a man who worked in the coal mines attended the revival, and his life was changed by Jesus, and he had a problem when he went back to work. He had always directed his donkeys that worked in the coal mines with him with really foul language that he no longer wanted to use. And unfortunately, his donkeys didn't know what he was asking them to do anymore. It's a picture of the fact that sometimes God changes small things in our lives, but they have a great impact on everything else and everyone else because everybody laughed when they noticed that. God does want to raise our lives up to be better. Paul writes, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. I don't have enough time to apply this passage to our culture today. There are times I cringe at what I see some Christians calling the God and country mentality of their interpretation of what it means to be an American. I, in my head, picture the man who roared into the Capitol building illegally that day, wearing a shirt that said, in God we trust. And I remember my heart breaking when I saw that displayed across the internet. We are to respect authority. We are to live at peace. We are to honor the position even when we don't think we can honor the person. We are to let our language and our attitude be godly even when ungodliness is legislated in our world. We aren't to scream in anger. We're to influence with love. Rebellion is the consequence of not living according to God's standards almost all the time. Paul goes on to say, for rulers, this is so important, Rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in, in authority? Then do what's right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Doesn't our culture need that today? There will always be authorities who do evil. Paul would be killed by the same authorities he's calling the Roman church to obey. We stand up against authority when the authority stands up against God's truth when the choice is between God and the world's authority, we must choose God. But when we can, we do whatever we can, however we can, whenever we can, to respect and honor other people while constantly teaching God's values. Rome was a sinful and secular regime, and Paul said, your best witness to them will be in the way you live your lives. And in 313, Constantine passed a law 
that enabled Christian churches to live without fear. But it would be 240 years after Paul wrote these words that these words came to fruition. Paul says, if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. I wanna say that to our world. If you're stealing from a store and you get hurt, you should have expected things could go bad when you went into the store to steal. When you race your car down a street, you should expect to get a ticket for exceeding the speed limit. We should expect those in leadership to punish wrong choices. We should expect that, we should want that. Yeah, there will always be some that overextend that and abuse that. And yeah, we should expect them to be punished as well. But if we do wrong things, we should expect things to go wrong as a result. It's always been that way. It will always be that way from the truth of God's word. So we submit to authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Paul says, don't do right because you're afraid of getting punished. Do right because it's the right thing to do. It's easy to confuse passion with conviction. They are two different things. Our passion should be the result of our convictions. And when those two things separate, things go wrong. And so in our culture today, breathe that in. Your passion isn't rewarded by God unless it's born from biblical conviction. Paul goes on to say, this is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So why are taxes such a great illustration for what Paul's teaching? Because my dad used to say, there's really only two guarantees, taxes and death. <laughs> he said those were the only two assurances in life. They both have a 100% uh, rate, it seems like. I don't wanna pay my taxes sometimes. It's a lot of money, but truthfully, I don't wanna live anywhere else either. So I pay what I owe. I don't do it joyfully all the time, but I pay what I owe. So do the same with honor and respect. There are some of our officials in this world that I wouldn't enjoy shaking hands with. I don't even enjoy listening to them sometimes, and I really don't enjoy some of their choices. But even if I can't respect the person, I'm called by God to respect the position. It's an important tenet that Paul's teaching for our Christian conduct. I close with this. Oswald Chambers wrote one of the most famous devotionals of all time called My Utmost for His Highest. And in that, he says, when a Christian jealously guards his secret life with God, his public life will take care of itself. If we will jealously guard our personal relationship with God himself, then our public life will be lived as an overflow of that relationship. The only way to live a life God is able to bless is for that life to be a, the overflow 
of your personal walk with God. So how much do you love the Lord today? How much are you willing to give your life as a living sacrifice to make that offering to God? It is our spiritual act of worship. And that life that's lived from the altar of sacrifice is the life that will change this world. Remember that when the doors to the church open and you go in next time, when you worship Him well, the rest of your life will be lived as a result. When a Christian jealously guards his secret life with God, his public life will take care of itself. Can I get an amen? See you next time.